All right, welcome everybody to today's lecture. Uh, today is our last day for the midterm week, and, and again, uh, we don't really have, or I'm not really doing any sort of a midterm uh, project or assignment or anything, so there's nothing particularly to worry about there. Um, today, I kind of want to more or less wrap up uh, our discussion on, on Git. Um, we're going to look at a few more topics. Uh, we're going to look at the object model here you can see on the screen, uh, look at creating patches, and look at something called cherry picking because I think these things will really help. Uh, again, if you're not familiar with Git, it'll really help you know, kind of hammer home some of the most important concepts of it or some things that you can do with it that aren't necessarily uh, easy to do or available in other, in other uh, version control systems. Um, with that, I'll, I'll probably create the next lab for next week, and we'll talk about a little bit of what that is. Uh, today some of the topics that it's going to cover and then next week on Tuesday we'll go through and actually I'll have the lab up by then and we'll, we'll talk through um, you know what the lab entails and what I'm looking for so uh, that's kind of where we're going to go between now and into next week and then um, also into next week then we'll probably start looking at uh, the, the second book this the one book that was required anyway uh, and that is clean code and working through some of those topics and um, continuing to look at secure code as well so that's kind of where we're going to head here for the next uh, over the, ne the course of the next couple of weeks. Uh, lab for this week uh, is due tomorrow night by midnight, so I think everybody, pretty much everybody, has their um, pull request in. So hopefully um, you're not having any issues with that. If you are, please let me know. Send me an email or, or something. Reach out, uh, and I can certainly help out or, or point you in the right direction. Um, before we get into some of the the content here, and You'll see I've been kind of shifting to using websites instead of creating uh, PowerPoint slides. And so if I forget to post the URLs in the website and you're not able to pull it off, I mean, here it is, I guess, if you can you can see that. Um, but I'll try to get it in there so you don't have to try to copy this through the video. Uh, but just in case for some reason I forget to do it or I don't do it quick enough, um, there it is. Uh, you can remind me, and I'll, I'll definitely post those in there because uh, you know, as we're talking about this right now, uh, it reminds myself that I forgot to do it from Tuesday's lecture, so I'll make sure to get that posted up there. Um, the first thing I want to do, though, before we get into any of this new material, is to just go back and oh, I always forget to close my email. Um, go back and take a look at the branching and why it wasn't exactly showing up the way I thought it would. So um, I've gone away from the developer one, developer two folders and what you'll see here is just again it's just a stock WordPress site uh, it's in a demo folder on my desktop and right now on that demo folder I have it tied to uh, a git repository in github but I don't that doesn't really matter at this point so uh, if we go to I'm in the demo folder and we do a status um, yeah that's fine so what is it saying I guess I haven't actually connected my remote Uh, yeah, I did. Well, I'll go ahead and get that synced up because I want to make sure that we don't get any errors here. So I'll push my changes. So I've cloned the repository from my GitHub account. It's just a demo repository, um, and I just added the WordPress site. So you know, more or less that initial commit that you've seen me do now a couple times. Um, what I want to do though is let's say at this point in time, you know, if we look at the tree. On our, you know, in something like a source tree, um, you can see here there's just this initial commit, and that's all there is to it. So if I go back to this repository, and let's say that I create a branch, so I do git checkout b, and we'll just call this the feature one branch. Um, now I'm on a new branch. So let's say in that code, or on this branch, then I do some changes. I change some code. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to do some really, uh, whoops, I don't want that file. Um, some really silly kind of arbitrary things. You know, I'll add some space here. I'll save it. I'll go back to the repo. Uh, we can do a status to see that there is in fact a change there. That is a space character, so it's different from the, you know, that initial or the commit that I'm working off of. Uh, so I can add that. Okay, and we'll commit. And I'll say something like adds a silly white space. Okay. Now let's say we go back to this and I do something a little more important like add a plugin and same thing here, we can check the status, we'll see, there it is, our WordFence, WordFence plugin and if I just go up my command history, I can add that folder and we'll do another commit and we'll say adds 
events plugin. Okay. And do a get status here. And I should be good to go, right? There's nothing, there's no changes here. Everything's been committed. Uh, and I'm on branch, I'm on my branch feature one. So now we'll go back and I'll check out master. So I'll go back to master. And if we look at the history here, you can see it still looks relatively flat. And that's what threw me off on Tuesday's lecture. So um, the best I can understand what source tree is telling me here is that even though this is a branch, because I haven't, there's no additional commits from the master line. It's not really showing as a deviation there. So I'm going to do something arbitrary just to show, just to invoke it, to show graphically that, that there is in fact a branch. Uh, and to do that, I'm just going to create a file uh, inside of the WordPress site and just to create a commit. That's all I'm going to do. So I'll add that test file and then I'll go ahead and commit it. And this will just be a test. Okay, so now that I've done that, now you can see right here, there's clearly a branch. There's my feature branch, and it's right here. And then there's that commit. So adding that additional commit from the master line, um, because now master, you know, there truly has been a diverging from this initial commit, uh, and that this line is now separate from this line. Uh, but now you can clearly see that there there is a feature branch. This is my branch that I just created. So um, you can imagine, let's say that you adopted Git flow, and you'd have your master line or your release line, and then you'd have a development line, and then you'd have you can have multiple feature lines or branches uh, out there in the code where something like this, a tool like this that can show you, you can get a nice graph going. Um, it, it can add a lot. It can help a lot in quickly being able to visually understand what's going on in the repository. So. That's, whole, that, that's what I was trying to get across uh, on Tuesday when I was creating those branches and showing you uh, what those would look like inside something like this. Uh, again, you can do, you can look at the history. Um, uh, no, I just forgot the command. I don't think it's history. Um, it's git show, yeah. Um, you can look at git show. You can look at commit history for whatever branch you're on by doing git show. Uh, so you can do it all from the command line, but it's not going to make quite as much sense as you can see here from the graphic graphically. Okay, so hopefully that clears that up. Um, I'll go ahead and we're going to use this repository here in just a little bit. And so I didn't push any of those changes. So what I'm going to do then is just simply delete everything. So. Rid of that, and I'm going to get rid of the .git account or the .git folder. That essentially turns this into uh, it's not a repository anymore. Uh, I did a clone here at some point, so I'm going to go back and you now I better just go and type it in. So let me grab that quick. Here's the demo. Okay, so there it is. Clone, paste, and dot. Nope, it's not an empty directory. What happens? Uh, thanks a lot, Apple, for the uh, .ds store file. And as a new Apple user, I still don't really know what the purpose of that is. Uh, git clone. Okay, so now it's an empty repository. We're good to go. So that'll be all set up, and we'll be able to check that out here in a little bit. Uh, use it for some other concepts here I want to talk about. Okay, so um, I want to spend a few minutes at least introducing the idea behind the commit. So we talk about commits, and, and commits become kind of the self-contained thing within a Git system, uh, and they really are, and this is the idea behind them. Uh, with every commit, a commit's going to be referenced by something that looks like this, and that's an actual SHA1 hash of the, the contents of the commit. And so every commit that you're going to have in a system is going to be referenced by the SHA-1 hash. Uh, they use a hashing algorithm because the odds of this algorithm producing two hashes, since this is going to be the, our unique identifier for each commit, uh, the odds of producing two, two hashes that, that are the same is, I don't know what is actually guaranteed, but it's, it's, very, it's very minimal, if not impossible. Um, that would be considered a collision in the world of, of I guess, cryptography. And so, the, the commit hash is something that becomes important to us. Uh, if we look at, go back to, uh, where did I go? Source tree. Go back to source tree. 
Okay, here you can see there's a commit, and it's only giving you a portion of it, and I think that's the last few characters of the commit. Uh, but that's how every commit inside the repository can be referenced by. Um, what is a commit then? Well, a commit is an actual object, and there are um, there are four different types of objects inside of Git. Um, for for the most part, right now we're going to care about blob, tree, and commit. Um, there's also a tag one, and I don't know if we'll spend the time to look at it, but you can you can essentially tag every single commit that you have. And so if you look at a Git flow. Um, and you have your, your main production line, what you would put in release or your master, um, you can take certain releases. So let's say that you have a series of commits and you know this commit culminates in a version one. And then you have maybe a couple more commits and then this, this commit finally culminates in version two. Uh, so you can tag those commits and that can then make it very easy for you to go back and reference the state of a repository at that particular tag. Um, that's good for version control, that's good for maybe rolling back changes, uh, a variety of things. So just keep in mind it's possible to essentially tag commits, but I probably won't, probably won't go through a demo of that. Um, right now we care about blob, tree, and commit. So uh, we'll take a look at those here as we move through this page. Um, really important to understand is that Git is much different than SVN, CVS, Mercurial, any sort of version that you've used before. So, in this author here, lists a couple of those out. Um, those systems are Delta storage systems, and they store differences between one commit and the next. And Git does not do that. What it does is it stores a snapshot of all the files uh, and what they look like each time you commit. And how it stores that snapshot then is by using blob, tree, and commit. Okay. So we'll define what these things are a little bit better, and then there's an example here at the bottom of this page that I think will tie, tie it all together for us. Um, so what's a blob? Blob's binary data. It's typically the contents of a file. So if you look at, in the world of a commit, we have a commit object that's a blob, and here would be our commit hash, 5b1, d3, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and then here's the content. So this looks like some sort of a C file, or maybe C++. Uh, a tree object. Tree objects usually are a bunch of pointers to blobs and other trees. And so using tree objects, then we can describe our file structure of whatever program or whatever code that we're tracking. And then the commit object itself, and that is what creates the link between um, the physical state of a tree with a description of how we got there and why. So you can see here, uh, here's our commit, there's our tree, there's the parent, there's the author, there's the committer, there's the commit message. So the commit is what ties all this stuff together. It ties together the tree objects and the blob objects. Okay, so what does that look like in the object model? So let's say that we have this structure here. Okay, this is going to represent a file system. We have a readme file. We have a library folder. Inside the library folder, there's an inc or an includes folder. Inside that folder, there's a file called tricks.rb. And inside the library folder, there's a mylibrary.rb file. Okay, so two directories, lib and inc, and three files, readme, tricks, and mylib. Okay, so initial commit. Let's say that we just went ahead and said, get init, get init, uh, get add everything, get commit. This is what we would have. We'd have our first commit. There's the name of the commit. Um, and now we'd have this pointer to a tree. We'd have information about who did the commit. And here is our tree object. So here's our commit object. Here is now our tree object. Uh, what does the tree object contain? Uh, it contains a pointer to a blob, which is the contents of our readme file. Okay, you can see that right here. There's the contents of our readme file. It also contains the pointer to another tree. Okay, what's inside that tree? It's the um, the lib folder, right? Which is right right here in this directory structure. So inside a lib, we have a blob pointer to a blob, mylib.rb and a tree pointer to another folder, which is INC, which is this guy right here. So this tree object contains information about this folder and this file and a pointer to that folder. Okay, that tree then, that tree object, it creates, uh, it has a pointer to a blob, tricks.rb, there's our blob, there's the contents of that file. And if we go back here, we can see there's tricks.rb. So every time we take a commit, create a commit, this is the type of information that it creates or, or keeps track of or generates these, these Git objects. And so 
With this ability, we're able to change the way that our actual repository looks because we know information about the commit, what added, what was removed, uh, what was changed, and the contents of that. Okay, and then here's some information here. So I post this link if you're interested here. You can take a quick look at the, the tag object. Okay, so I think it's a pretty good uh, example here or diagram of that. Um, this is the this is a book. So Scott Chaikin, I believe, is the author here. Uh, and again, another book, another resource for or studying and learning about Git. Okay, so let's see here. What do we want to talk about now? Um, two concepts I want to talk about today. One is going to be uh, cherry picking, and the other one is going to be creating a patch. So uh, let's go ahead and let's take a look at cherry picking first. Um, okay. So with cherry picking, uh, cherry picking is a great feature from the Git offers, and it's based off of commits. And what cherry picking allows us to do is essentially look at um, whatever branch that we're currently on, uh, we're able to cherry pick commits from other branches, any commit from the repository, and then apply apply those commits to our branch. Okay, so we'll have, zoom this in a little bit, we'll have a git cherry pick command. Okay, and if we look at this, these diagrams, uh, I, I hope that they can convey exactly what cherry pick is doing. So, um, in this case, get cherry pick and then E. And what, what, we're, what this author is representing, E is representing our hash, so the commit hash. So we do actually have to type all that out, or at least copy and paste it, which is what I do, because I'm not going to type that out, because I'll probably make a lot of errors. Um, but let's say we have this, this structure, these commits. Each letter here represents a commit. And for each one of these uh, cherry pick commands that we're going to execute here, uh, we're going to start at, let's say that we're at commit H. So if we're at commit H right here, and we want to apply uh, git cherry pick E, and we're at H, then what happens? E, that those objects get replayed in front of H. So in this case, the author is calling it E prime, and whatever was done on this commit is now played here, and it's done before my commits at H. Okay, this is not this isn't just a commit that's now copied over. This becomes a new commit. So there's a new commit hash. Uh, but the same, whatever changes, whatever objects were here, were played over here. Okay. We can do this multiple. Get cherry pick CDE. So if we're at H, and I want to play CDE, then you can see we replace C, then D, and then E. And now all those commits are played in front of H, because I'm currently at position H here. Um, let's see, on this site, there is a quick slideshow that steps, ever, steps you through it. Uh, I don't think that's overly necessary there, but uh, at least it looks nice. It's a nice visual. Um, so how would this look in the real world? And this is how I've actually used cherry picking in the past. Um, so we're going to go back to this WordPress site. And I'm going to let's go to the plugins folder. And I'll make sure that I'm on the master branch. And we're on the initial on the initial commit. So um, let's go ahead and do a git checkout, create a new branch, and I'm just going to call this feature one again. Okay, now let's say that um, I'm going to do some things that are just kind of silly and arbitrary, uh, but the idea is that let's say I actually made some substantial changes to the code base. Okay, so in this case I'm going to do kind of that same thing I just did. I'm going to add an, uh, a space here just to create a difference, um, just to create a difference in the code. So if I do a git status, I can see something's changed, and that allows me to commit. So I'll go ahead and I'll add that in. For I'll stage that, and then I'll give it a message like add silly, silly white space. Okay, again, I'm just trying to do it quick and easy. Um, the idea here is here though that you would you would do something substantial. Right? You would you'd be experimenting with code. You'd be testing out a new way of doing something. You, you know, you're developing. You're on a branch and you're just developing. Okay, so you just committed some code because you felt that it was an appropriate time to commit. Um, let's say now I do something moderately important uh, in the context of us adding plugins to this WordPress site. So now I go in and I add I add this WordFence plugin. So I'll go ahead and add that in. Okay, and I'll say git commit adds. Uh, 
Oops. Word fence plugin. Okay. Um, and now doing some more development, and let's say that I realize that this, whatever I did here, uh, I really don't need. So I change that back to the original. In this case, I, you know, I'm not reversing the logic, I'm just removing the white space. Um, but now I have another commit. So I'll go ahead and commit that, add it, and now I'll say good commit. M and remove white space. Okay, so I'm going to go back to master and I'm going to just do what I did earlier um, so that we can see this visually. Okay, take a look at this at source tree. Alright, so what do we have? Um, I had my feature branch here. That's this nice pinkish fuchsia color. Um, and if we look at this, we can see that there are three commits. Um, but of these commits, this one and this one essentially cancel out. Uh, this is the one that I, this is the only one I really care about. So there's a variety of things we can do. I mean, we can go ahead and go through a pull request and we can merge uh, these commits into the master line. But maybe we don't want these commits because they really don't do anything. They really are. Uh, kind of a silly commit. Um, one thing we can do is we can cherry pick. So if we look at this WordFence plugin, we need to get the commit hash. So we have git log pretty equals one line. Oops, one line. Uh, well, we're on master. I want to go to uh, feature one. Okay, so run that same command. All right, so there's the four four commits. The original one is the initial from the master. Uh, then we have the adds a silly white space, adds our word fence, word fence plugin, and removes the white space. So I'm really only interested in grabbing this one commit. So we'll, we'll copy the title, we'll copy the hash, um, and now I can go back to master. And I don't care about origin at this point, uh, but I can say let's get cherry pick and then I can paste in that hash. Okay, and what happened? Get status. Let me clear the screen here. Um, get status, we're on branch master. It's ahead of origin, that's fine. That's so we don't care about the, the origin or the remote right now. Um, but we did the cherry pick and it replayed that commit on this branch, but there's nothing to commit because it was automatically committed for us. Um, so here you can see, this is the point that we were at, test, and now it played it for us. Okay, and there it added the word, word fence plugin. So it just took that commit and added it into our, you know, put it as a commit into our, oops, our branch here, our master branch. Okay, so no merging, um, there's no, you know, no pull request, you know, the, the history you don't see. Uh, a line indicate that this has been merged, it just simply played it. Okay, so that's one way. Um, what happens then to this branch? You know, it's completely up to you. Uh, if that's all you needed, and now you don't want to merge that branch, you can just delete the branch, get rid of it. it it's no longer a part of the repository. Um, you can continue to develop on it, but you have to be careful then at some point in time when you merge, uh, these commits still exist. And so there are ways to go back through and completely eliminate those, uh, but we won't cover there cover those right now. Um, so with the lab then, with the next lab, uh, what I'll probably do is create uh, how exactly I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm not 100% sure at this point in time, but what I'll likely do is we'll create um, some sort of a branch and I'll put uh, a bunch of commits on it and I'll ask each one of you to, to cherry pick an, an individual commit and bring it into our master line. Um, so more or less what we just did here is what we'll be looking at doing. So. Hopefully that makes sense. If you have any questions on chair picking, um, definitely let me know. Uh, consult any documentation here. Well, not this one, but oh, did I close it? Oh, I must have. Um, but anyways, uh, the book that I referenced earlier, that's going to have a lot of great information about it, uh, as well as send me any questions. Any doubt, any concern, any ambiguity, any confusion, send me, send me an email, let me know. I'd be more than happy to respond via email or, or get online, do a Google Hangout or a Skype or something. So, okay. Um, 
I did want to demo one other thing quick uh, before we go to patching, and that is, let's say that this is our demo. So let's stay with this, this repository here that we've been working on, and let's look a little bit more about the project management feature. So, so far we've been primarily focused on code and how do we manage the actual code. Um, with the features in something like a GitHub, okay, we have an issue tracker. And with the issue tracker, then what we can do is we can create issues. Uh, so let's say that I want to create um, an issue and it's a bug fix. Which I won't, I won't call it, I won't give it a title bug fix, but I'll say um, I don't know, something simple like remove or fix SQL injection vulnerability on you know this database page. Okay, so we can you can write the title of the issue. Um, you can submit the issue. Uh, what we can do then with this issue is we can create labels. Okay, so let's say that this is a bug fix. Oh, that was already a bug label. Same. So we can we can label this as a bug. Okay. Uh, we can set milestones. So let's say that we're working on features. Then we can create milestones and say that this. This is a feature issue, uh, and it's part of our, you know, our current sprint or our current milestone or our current feature set. Um, you can assign it, of course, and now this gives you the ability to track, you know, create the issues and then track them throughout your team through assignments, through comments, uh, through the ability to tag. So if we go back to our issues page, you'll see here we're going to have this would list all of our issues and all of the tags that would come behind it. So we can quickly go in here and filter and say, you know, give me everything that is tagged with uh, a bug. I don't know how to do it, put a filter right now, but no, it's probably right here. Yeah, so filter everything with just a bug. Um, there we go. Uh, so as a manager then, it, again, it can give you a pretty quick and easy snapshot or insight into, you know, what's being developed, what's being worked on on the application, uh, who's working on what, uh, what kind of comments, what kind of activity are going on. Because then anybody on your team that has information or has access to these issues, they can leave comments. Um, there's something called uh, GitHub Markdown. Okay, so there's this whole page on uh, mastering issues, but there's also this writing on GitHub. Uh, and you'll see that GitHub is not the only one that does this. There are a lot of different um, kind of online project management based tools that have their own, uh, they call it markup, markdown, um, but it's their own, here's your GitHub flavored markdown. It's their, it's, it's their ability to recognize syntax in what you're writing to, in order to give you that project management type features. So you can create lists, okay? but you have to know exactly how to type them in GitHub in order for them to work. So with any of these systems, it's good to just spend a few minutes and figure out what kind of writing styles you can adopt in order to truly maximize you know, how your documentation, how your issue tracking works. Because then this can become a big part of your documentation. Um, issues as you create them, you can see here, they automatically generate a number one, number two, number three, and so forth, sequentially as you create issues. And what this is important, and I'll show you in just a sec, um, we can use this information to actually reference because we're using GitHub. We're pushing our commits, we're syncing to our central repository, which is GitHub. Um, we can use these to actually reference issue numbers in our commit messages, and those will show up. Those will show up in the history of that issue. So, let's take a look at doing that. Um, we'll go back to the repository. Uh, we're on. Let's see, we're on master, we haven't committed. Um, let's do this thing. I'm gonna just say go ahead and git remove test.txt and then that's my status deleted. So git commit dash m and the, the message here is not gonna actually correlate to this issue, but what you'll see is that if I reference the issue number in this message, then GitHub will automatically take that message and associate it with the issue. So could say something like uh, hot fix for issue number one. Okay, so there's the commit message. Let's say get log pretty equals. Oops. 
Okay, there's my title. Um, let's go ahead and push this to origin. Okay, and I don't know if this will automatically update, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is reference, and there it is. See, uh, I referenced this issue from a commit just now. Hot fix for issue number one. All right, so it can it can start to integrate in the project management what you're doing in the repository. And so if you create a scheme or a system in which something like this, something like your issue tracker, your bug tracker, your feature tracker um, is intelligent and it can integrate with your commit messages, then you can really start to tie, um, really start to tie everything together and really get a full picture, a history on, um, you know, what happened for this issue, who worked on it, what did they commit, I can look at the commits, I can see the kind of work that they're doing, uh, and, and I think it's just great, phenomenal insight. Um, with that, there is a lot of good collaboration issues, okay, so we got milestones, we've got labels, we've got assignees, we just talked about those. Um, and notifications, mentions, and references. So uh, inside the code, I don't think anybody's added to this repo, uh, but you can say at, and you can mention other teams, other repositories. Uh, if I had other team members in this repository, I could mention uh, you know, someone specifically or individual. I could say, you know, say I have a team member, uh, Jane, I could say at Jane. Uh, how does this look or can you give me some insight on this and she'll be notified that I mentioned her in this comment So that way she is aware of me asking for her help her notification settings. They're they're in the, in the github interface here somewhere um, She can see that and then she can respond to it uh, What takes this even a step further especially for remote teams and this is something that I've used in the past with some remote teams um, client called HipChat. And I don't know if I'll be able to show a demo or anything here. At least I don't have them offhand. Uh, we'll make them pay for an ad. And what's great about this thing is it's an online chat room. And so it looks just like a, a basic vanilla instant messenger. Um, but what you can do inside of this is it can tie in. It can hook into your GitHub accounts. And now you can have a messenger client running. And when, when you see uh, certain activity, on the repository in you know in the issue trackers in the uh, the commits it can show up in your github or in your instant messenger so you know if all your team is in there anyway on a daily basis because that's how you collaborate online stay in touch um, then let's say that I uh, you know I'm closing a pull request uh, we can hook into github and then inside the the hip chat client we can say hey Josh just closed pull request number 42 and so that way your team can be just fully aware of everything that's going on with your code, with your repositories, and things like this. I'm not saying that HipChat's the only tool out there. Um, it's just the one that I've used. It was free. Uh, of course, it's an Atlassian tool, so the, those guys put out some pretty good products, uh, but it just it worked well. It really worked well for a geographically dispersed team to use. Okay, um, the last thing we'll look at then is creating a patch. And uh, again, it's a very important concept because uh, patches allow us to fix things in our code relatively quickly and easily. Um, this will be probably the second part uh, that I'm envisioning right now that the next lab is going to just be two parts, the cherry picking uh, and then creating a patch. And so what a patch lets us do is, is it basically it allows us to take a commit or a series of commits and create a file, a patch file, that then can replay those that that commit wherever you want it. You can apply it to any repository that you want. So um, minimize this. Uh, don't need that right now. Don't need this. So what we're going to look at is there is. Let's get rid of this. And okay, so I've got a Drupal folder, and um, there is. Uh, Drupal uh, Drupal's a framework or content management system depending on how you want to look at it it's it's kind of sort of like a WordPress uh, it's an open source framework it allows you to do a lot of things uh, kind of out of the box um, with that it's a it's a well maintained it's a very active project and so there's a team of people dedicated to the security of it um, with that they issue patches they issue fixes they get CVEs just like any other product or software out there um, recently, there's been a problem, an SQL injection vulnerability in one of the files, in the Drupal core files. 
uh, that file happens to be database.inc. And so what we need to do is we need to create a patch for it. And so what I will provide you with is the file. Okay, so here is, uh, in this case, here is the, this is the file, so database.inc. Um, what you'll see is the line that needs to be changed. And then what I'm going to do, of course I closed it. I've got to get the actual, got to get the actual fix for it. Okay, so let me grab that. Where is it? Oh, there's a file that shows the, the fix. Um, just give me one second here and try to find that link. Closed it, didn't mean to close it. Well, we'll take this, I guess. Okay, so what you'll see then is you'll have the file. Uh, I'll also provide the patch or what needs to be changed. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to expect you to figure that out. Um, and so I'll say this is what needs to be changed in the file, and this is the line number where the vulnerability is. So in this case, what we can do is we can go here and say this is, well, let me back up one second. So this is the file. Um, so we don't have to go through the whole process of, you know, now let's do this all over again with, with the Drupal and let's create a repository and get all the Drupal files. We're just going to work with this one, this one, one, uh, this one page. So I'm going to change into that uh, Drupal folder and I'm going to create a repository here. Reinitialize the existing Drupal. So the status should be that that database file, so we'll have to go ahead and commit it. Or no, I'm sorry, we got to add it. Database type in. Commit. And there's a way to do add and commit in one line. I just can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, I'll just say this is initial. Okay. Now, this file is being tracked. So if we come in here and we get rid of this offending line, uh, we can go ahead and grab... Did I grab the right one? Oops, what I wanted. Ah, uh, all right, hold on, I gotta double check that get the right. I'm using QuickTime. If I could pause the video right now, I would, but I can't. If I is, I can only stop it and then I'd have to create two part files and I didn't really want to do that. So let me grab the page. Okay, so let me start over because this is, I already applied that. So when I ran through my demo to make sure everything would work, um, I forgot to rewind it. So let me just go ahead and I'm gonna reset this repository. So let's just get rid of everything here. Um, go to the git folder. Let me go ahead and open up this file. Line 736 is where the problem is. I must have applied it to there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that and I'm going to go to a vulnerable version of Drupal that I have. And I'll just copy that back out. And let's double check that version. You know what? I must have actually changed the file that I'm trying to pull from. So I guess it would only be fitting that I have multiple demos go wrong. But all right, so what we should be seeing. So I, I must have saved the file from that other folder, that file, that website. This is what we should be seeing, uh, and this is the this is the problem line. So this file then now I've just changed on my desktop. So I'm going to go ahead and close those out and.
folder, there it is. Okay, so let's move let's move this in now. Okay, so now we can initialize we can add database, we can commit it. Okay, um, Alright, so now let's open this file up. Scroll back down to 736, that's our line number. Seven. Okay, so that's the problem line. This is our fix for it, so that's what I'll provide you with. So now we can add that fix. Okay, if we go back to the repository, we'll see, of course, uh, there's been a change. So we can add database to be staged. We can now commit it. And our, our commit message can be something like you know, hot fix for SQL injection vulnerability, um, you know, per CVE whatever the CD identifier was. Okay, so that's great. Now, when it comes to updating software, uh, when you use something like Git, uh, what you can do then is you can say, okay, you, know, you, can, you can upgrade the system. You, you just need to take all these files and you need to perform the upgrade. Or when it's, you can say here's a patch, and now you can just apply this patch to your repository and it'll automatically adjust the files. So, um, if you go and look at Get rid of that. Alright, so this is what we're going to want to do. This is our command. Okay, so what we want to say is we want to say git format patch. Um, and now here we have some options. Uh, in this case, I want to just create a patch based off of that one commit. So if I go and I say, you know, git log, here's this, here's the commit hash for that one commit. So I can now say copy that, and I can say git uh, format patch dash one, there's command line arguments here. Paste that hash in. Um, we'll say that we want to redirect the output to standard out and then send that to create an actual file. So in this case, we'll say something like, you know, hotfix sqli.patch. Okay, and now we should, what we should have seen is our hotfix just got created. We we'll go ahead and take a look at that. Um, this is our actual patch. Okay, so what do we have inside of here? Let's see if I can zoom in. Okay. There's the patch, there's the, the hash, the one that I created it from. This is who created it, this is the date that it was created. Um, this is the subject, it's automatically tagged as a patch and then the name that I gave it. Um, here's the file and now here's the information, here's the diff uh, information about what it changed. So remove this and that commit and I added this. Right? And now this is a patch, this is a file. And so what I can do with this file is, and what, what Drupal actually did is they said, well you can upgrade minor version so um, yesterday we were the current minor version was 7.31 today because of this because of this problem it's now 7.32 and so you can just upgrade to 7.32 which is a much more involved process or if you just need to fix that that one database issue because that's the security issue um, you can just apply this patch to your repository and get the changes out quickly um, so that that is how you create it so that'll that'll most likely be creating a patch here um, for the second part of the lab. Um, you don't have to do just specific commits. You, you could do a series of commits. So in this case here, if say, they say they just play master, let's just create a patch from master. That'll just take all the commits that's currently on master and create a patch out of that. So um, it really just boils down to how do you want to create, how do you want to create the patch? What commits do you want to use in order to create this patch? Uh, because you can pick, you can mix and match, you can create uh, however you want to do it, from a single commit like we just did here to a variety of commits, uh, any number of commits. So uh, let's see, I think that's it. Um, so today we covered kind of the object model to give you a better idea of how, you know, how Git is different than other version control systems and how kind of under the hood it works in order to keep track of changes to, you know, blobs, trees, uh, and the different commits. Um, we talked about creating a patch and then we talked about cherry picking. So 
Uh, any questions on that, uh, please let me know. Again, just to reiterate, on Tuesday, we'll be getting the next lecture out, and I'll have the, na the next lab up probably on next Tuesday. So uh, we'll take a look at that, and it'll be loosely based off of, uh, closely based off of the cherry picking and the patching and, and maybe one other uh, item that I come up with. So uh, have a good weekend, and I'll talk to you guys on Tuesday.